the service today, we will be praying uh, for quite a number of people who I think this message will be relevant to, including our dear pastor who's, who's not well at the moment. So welcome again to church this morning, and I do pray that today's message won't be of me, but it will be of the Lord and from the Lord. And today we'll be speaking about such a prevalent topic, and I'm sure for those of you that have received the bulletin on your phones, um, you will have seen the title of today's message, which is Hope. I see we also do have a few newcomers uh, to the church. Um, I won't single you out because I know that sometimes that's a little bit intimidating, but welcome to all the newcomers. We pray that you have a really, really spe uh, special time with us today, and we are a church that serves tea and coffee after the service with some biscuits, so you'll enjoy that. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> we live in a world at the moment where sometimes things feel like they are a little bit out of control, right? Where we just feel, man, how do we get by? How do we cope? How do we... How do we handle what's thrown in, in our direction? Especially in light of kind of the last three years and what we've had to deal with with the last three years. I know COVID isn't something that we, we mention very often, and it's not the first word that leaves our lips, but it had a, a massive impact on a number of people. In fact, uh, I had a friend, and, and God willing, he'll come to know the Lord as his Lord and Savior someday, but he's a good friend of mine. I've known him for years, and I love him to pieces, but he owned a tobacco shop. And uh, because of COVID and the tobacco laws that they passed, he lost his, everything. He lost the shop. He lost everything. He lost his work. And so he was in a place where he lost a lot of hope. And I think there might be some of us in the congregation this morning that might feel that we're in that place as well. I'll share a little bit about the, the latter now in, in a second, but I want to share a little bit of a, a story just as a preamble, a sermon illustration to the message this morning. Uh, there was a, a, a group of youngsters, eight youngsters, that, and this is a real-life story. It's a true story. You can find it on Google. So when you read it on Google, you'll probably read it a lot better than I say it. I am paraphrasing the story just as a disclaimer. Um, but these eight youngsters had just finished school, um, and, and they lived in America. And what, one of the things that they wanted to do, I think they lived in Oregon, is they wanted to climb a mountain. So they went to one of the biggest mountains on Oregon, and they said they are going to climb this mountain together. They didn't go on a matric vacation, as we would have in South Africa. They just wanted to summit this mountain, get to the top, look at the view, and just you know feel as if they've conquered this mountain. And so all of them kind of get ready. They pack their stuff. They've got their bags. They've got their shoes. They've got everything that they need to climb this mountain, and they go. Um, they, they went, you know, kind of their, their first 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters. It kind of seemed all good. Four, five, six hundred, started getting a bit harder. From about seven, eight hundred meters, it started getting super snowy. And none of them had prepared for the snow that was about to come at the top of this mountain. None of them had thought about the snow either. And so they didn't have the correct shoes that they needed for the snowy parts of this mountain. I think they were 400 meters from the top of the mountain. And the guy that was leading the tour... He, he, he kind of stepped on a rock, and the rock, rock started falling, and everyone behind him had to kind of jump out of the way on the rock, except one of his friends, we'll call him James for the sake of the story, James got hit by the rock, and he started sliding and sliding and sliding down, and he hit a number of things until he fell off of a cre crevice. The person uh, in front, let's call him Scott, was trying to catch James from falling off the crevice, and instead of catching James, he fell off the side of the mountain as well. And so James had a bro broken arm. He hit his head really, really hard. In fact, the story tells us that he cracked his skull. He had blood all over his face. Everybody else managed to kind of get up okay. They didn't really hurt themselves. But Scott and James were a bit injured. Well, while they were walking, kind of, and this is a true story, while they were trying to get back and slipping all over the place, they're trying to get back to their campsite, they, um, they all kind of were falling all over the place, slipping. And James and Scott wouldn't believe it, but they fell again. And they slipped again, and they ended up slipping into a river. Now, Scott's got a terribly broken arm. and he, uh, Sorry, James has got a terribly broken arm, and he's got blood all over his face. He's really, really injured. He was already struggling to walk, and now he's fallen into this river. And um, Scott loses him, and they're just kind of trying to keep their head up above water, and they, they're going down the river. And all of a sudden, uh, James hits another boulder, and he injures himself even more. And Scott... He hits a boulder as well, and he breaks his leg. And so here we've got, we've got James with a broken arm and a fractured skull, and we've got Scott with a broken leg. 
Well, by God's grace and by some miracle, these two managed to get out of the river, but they lost their six other friends. Their six other friends obviously try to make their way back to camp. It's dark. It's cold. They're wet. They've got wet clothes. They've got a broken leg, a broken arm, and a fractured skull, and they just, you know, they're thinking this is the end. They are going to die. Well, Scott looks down, and he sees this light beaming from James's pocket, and he says, James, what's that light? And he says, no, well, that was a tactical torch that I brought with me in case we got stuck in the dark. And so he took this torch out, and, and, and James says, uh, Scott says to James, he says, you know, maybe that's the only thing we need to get back to camp is a little bit of light to lead the way. And so Scott's busy hopping, and, and James has got a broken arm, and it was a couple of, I think it was about two or three kilometers for them to get back to the campsite, but they made it. But the reason I told you that story was that last part. After everything they had been through, all they needed was a torch that worked to give them a little bit of hope to get back to the campsite. And I found that to be such an inspiring story because sometimes when we're in such a dark place, the smallest amount of light can lead us home. Let's pray for today's message. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning. We thank you so much that we have a place that we can call home. We have a place that we go to after work and school on a daily basis and we can call that place home where we have our meals and our family lives there. And we're so grateful for that place, Lord Jesus Christ. But we've also got a spiritual home, which is this building that we get to come to, the church, Father God, and we're so blessed to call this place our home too. Father God, none of me and all of you, I pray that you would speak deep into our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so I've got a little bit of homework for all of you. It's easy homework, and I believe all of you can do it, and I'm not going to single anybody out, but I want you all to memorize this one verse of Scripture as you go home today. And I want you to keep this on your hearts and on your lips and in your mind at all times. I did this when I I recently preached this message, and it really, really helps. It's Psalm 33, verse 22. It says, May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Psalm 33, verse 22. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And so there's one massive, incredible passage of Scripture that speaks about hope from somebody that understands hope like no other. And it's Romans chapter 8. So if you turn with me to Romans chapter 8, it will be on the screen this morning as well. We're going to be reading through Romans chapter 8, the back end of Romans chapter 8. And I look so forward to sharing this message with with you all this morning. And I think someone who understood hope better than all of us was, was Paul because he lived on hope alone. I mean, we look at his life and we think, man, oh man, how did this man even live? So Romans chapter 8, we're going to be reading from chapter 18. I lost my place in my Bible. There we go. Sorry, Romans chapter 8 from verse 18, not chapter 18. And I'll kind of break this passage down as we, as we read through. But there's this overarching theme of hope from verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. decay. I'll explain that in just a little bit. And brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 24, and we'll stop there for now. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? I'd like to ask you all, as a congregation this morning, and perhaps let's make this fun and interesting, I'm not going to ask people to share, turn to somebody next to you, and I want you to ask them this question. Where do you find your hope? What gives you hope?
Okay, I'm going to play the super spiritual card. How many people said Jesus? Well, there we go. <laughs> I thought that would be the answer. So there's half the church. And that's great. But what about Jesus? What about Jesus gives you hope? And that's what we're going to be speaking about this morning. So, so this ladder, and there's a great pastor, preacher, author, speaker. I love him. I love listening to his sermons. He preached a series called the Out of Control series. Um, I tried to look for it on YouTube last night. I couldn't find it, but it's a great series. And, and, and he speaks about a ladder. Now, when we look at a ladder, a few things come to mind, right? We think, well, a ladder is used to get us up somewhere. Either we need to use it to get onto the roof of the house because there's a broken tile, or we need it to fix um, a, a light bulb, or we may need it to get some Tupperware. You know that soup bowl that you use once a year is right on top of the cupboards, that's what we use the ladder for. So, so a ladder is used to get us up. But, but when we take our first step onto a ladder, we hope unconsciously or subconsciously that this ladder is going to hold us up. Maybe subconsciously as well, we're hoping that we don't fall off of the ladder. And so as we're stepping onto a ladder, there's this element of hope that's innately within us because we're hoping that nothing, we're hoping that the ladder won't fall to the left or to the right. There's this hope that this ladder will carry us. There's also hope that by stepping on top of the ladder, we'll be able to fix that light bulb. Or maybe you're hoping, oh man, I hope it's just the light bulb that's broken and not that we need to, you know, that there's something bigger. We're hoping that we'll be able to get that Tupperware without the thousands of other Tupperwares falling down as well. So there's innately this hope that happens when we step onto a ladder. But in order to have that hope, we need to take those steps. We need to physically have that action of stepping onto the ladder in order to trust it, to hope in it. And so when we look at that in a spiritual sense, by looking at a ladder, it's not going to take us anywhere. But by taking that first step, we're actually trusting in the hope that we have in the ladder. And, and that paves, again, the foundation to, to what we'll be speaking about today. It's also so much easier for us as human beings to be hopeless to look at our life situation and to say, oh man, but this, this is a hopeless situation. I mean, my, our family recently, this, the, these past couple of days, we went 63 hours without electricity. And, and so just to put the cherry on top, yesterday at, at 1 o'clock they decided to, to turn our water, well, our water wasn't coming anyway, obviously because of pumps that weren't on because of power and blah, blah, blah. But 63 hours without power, it's very frustrating. <laughs> And we don't have an inverter or solar or anything at home. And, and, and it's so easy to be hopeless. In fact, our demeanor at home wasn't good. And I had to say to my wife and, and to my mother-in-law, I just said, guys, our demeanor needs to change because our daughter was picking up on it. Now, for her, we made it fun. We were lighting candles and playing stalk the lantern. And you kind of make the best of the situation. But she was happy regardless of the situation. And it was such a stark reminder for me that I don't need to put my hope in the electricity at home. You know, there's other things. We've got a roof over our head and food in our tummies, and that's fine. But it's so easy to be hopeless. You, you might have a flat tire, or your tire might pop, and you're like, oh, I don't have the money to fix this. Or you might be going through a terrible work situation. You're like, I don't have the energy to go through this. It's so easy to be hopeless. How do we find hope? I find hope sometimes in family. I've got good... Friends that I call family that are just there for me and care for me. And, and let me tell you again, folks, and I've, I think I've said this again at church. If you see someone struggling, if you see someone going through a hard time, when you ask them, what can we do to help you? Sometimes they don't have the answer. I've learned this. Get yourself ready. Go to Checkers. Go to Woolworths. Buy a packet of spaghetti and mince. Make them a meal and take them a meal. I promise you. You're restoring hope in their life and say, here's a bowl of spaghetti and mints. It's not the most expensive meal, but you're showing them that you love them, that you care for them. I find my hope in Jesus. How do, how do I find my hope in Jesus? And we'll speak about this in the sermon this morning. Well, I know that, that he's there for me, and I know that he cares for me, and I know that he's listening to me when I pray. I know that he loves me, and that's a big part of today's message. I find my hope in going home. I love seeing my daughter and my wife and playing with them and laughing. But I also find my hope in moments. You'll find as you live your day out, as something happens, somebody will come to you and make you laugh or say something or do something for you at work or do something for you at school. And, and that just kind of picks you up for that moment. And that, that's hope that God gives you. An incredible quote by Shia Sumlin. We might have it on the screen as well. Well, no, sorry, we won't. Um, but he says this. He says, he says, 
You can live 40 days without food and three days without water, but you cannot live a second without hope. I'll say it again. You can live 40 days without food and three days without water, but you cannot live a second without hope. Hope is that driving factor that, that helps us live. But how, how do we ta- maintain hope in a world that is sometimes hopelessly broken? So, so, so to end off the story with the electricity issue that we had, we, we've got community groups. How many of you are on a WhatsApp community group? It's probably the funniest thing to be on, right? There's a funny video I shared by Dial Direct the other day where you're on this community group and someone's saying, oh, I've lost my cat. And the next minute someone's saying, hey, I'm selling these slippers. And you're like, how did that happen? Someone said, I lost my cat and someone's selling slippers. But, you know, on this community group, people were going crazy because they didn't have power. And this person saying, we don't know what's happening. And the city council, city power saying, we don't know what's happening. And people are just, oh, we don't have power, you know. So the electricity truck comes. How do we maintain hope in a world that is hopelessly broken? Eventually, after finding the substation that they need to be at, I jumped in the back of the van yesterday and I said to the guys, they laughed at me, I said, you will not leave the suburb until you fix our electricity. And I'm in the back of the van with them and they, they're laughing at me. They're so good-natured about it because why is this guy jumping in our van, right? And it took them, I'm not joking, it took them less than two minutes to fix the problem. We were out for 63 hours and it took them less than two minutes to fix our problem. How do we maintain hope in a world that sometimes feels hopelessly broken, right? So anyways, we we were good natured about it and they helped us. But this is what Paul says in the passage that we've read this morning in Romans chapter 8 from verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Essentially, Paul is saying that what we are going through now is nothing compared to what God has in store for us. And it's sometimes so difficult to keep that eternal perspective in mind, but God has got something so cool prepared for us in heaven. Verse 19, it says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. We are children of God, and we have an inheritance that cannot perish or spoil or fade. And God, again, He's personified this for believers to say that creation, we wait in eager expectation for what God has in store for us in heaven. Verse 20 to 21, these two verses, let me just say, can be an entire sermon on, uh, on on its own, speaking about the first Adam and the second Adam and what that means and what sin means. But essentially, it says this, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. So because Adam sinned, we inherited that initial sin. And I'll help, under, help us understand that now. Verse 21, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. When you read in the Old Testament, you see the stories of how human beings have sinned. All the way from Adam and Eve making the wrong decisions, God gave them free will and they misused that free will, right? And unfortunately, because of that, because of that sin that they brought into the world, we inherited that sin now as believers today. And I'll share a fun story about that. But then we look at, um, we look at Ab- all the patriarchs, Abram, Jacob. We, we look at how they sinned and how that sin has fallen back on us. We look at the story of Noah's ark. We look at so many stories in the Old Testament, how God gave people opportunity of opportunity. All the kings in the Old Testament, God gave them so many opportunities, but they sinned and sinned and sinned. And so we've inherited the sin. And unfortunately, it's brought about thorns and thistles. And we live in a world that is sinful and depraved, and it's hard for for a lot of us. And we see this even in children. And, and, And when I look at this idea of inherited sin, and I think, but a baby is so pure and wonderful and awesome, right? You look at a baby and you just love them. But, but I was reminded by this, how children have inherited sin, even as a baby, and how we've inherited sin. We went to Spur the other day. Our neighbors kindly took us to Spur. And um, Spur's got this promotion on where if you buy a certain kiddies meal that costs an arm and a leg, you get a free toy. No, no, they've, but they've put that in the price. I promise you, that's a crazy price for a meal. So, so, so now... There's a big playroom at Newmarket Mall Spur, big play area where all the kids can play, and uh, half the children are playing with these cars, and the other half are fighting with the children that are playing with the cars because they don't have cars. My daughter was one of them. 
So you just hear these kiddies running, oh, mommy, mommy, I want a car, I want a car, you know? And my daughter was one of them. I'm like, oh, dad, I want a car. So I'm like, oh, gosh, we're going to have to buy a car. So we did. So before this even happened, my daughter was in the playroom, and there was another little boy playing with his car and having so much fun. And, and I was sitting with Avia, and, and Avia's playing and having fun with this boy. And then she, I could see she really wanted to play with the car. So I asked the little boy, please, would you let her play with your car for two minutes? And he did. He's like, here we go, and she's playing, and she's smiling, and she's having so much fun. So then she runs to me, and she asks me for a car, and we get her a car, and she goes back. And that same little boy asked her to play with that car, and she's like, no ways, this is my car. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, what just happened, you know? But I've learned that young children know justice, but they don't know grace. They know mine is mine, but they don't know let me share. And that's something, as parents, we need, we need to actually teach them. And I find that that's part of our inherited sin, that idea of justice versus grace. And so it was a good lesson. It was a good object lesson for her that evening as well. Whenever we sin, we complain, we become frustrated, we feel hopeless, it's because of the depravity of Adam's sin. It's because we are sinful, broken human beings, and sometimes it's just so hard. It's just so hard to, for us to understand that God has given us hope. So we look at this ladder again, and we look at the fact that we need to take that first step in order to hope and to trust in that ladder. We need to, we need to hope that it's not going to fall on us, but we've got the faith that it's not going to fall either. And, and sometimes we get to the top of the ladder, and we're not able to fix that light bulb, or we're not able to fix the roof, or we're not able to grab that tupperware, and we just can't do it ourselves. The, the other day, we've got an anthracite stove at home. I'm full of stories today. I'm sorry about that, everyone. And we were fixing this anthracite stove, and there were three people that were, were in our house, and they were helping fix the stove, and, and the, the guy needed to clean the chimney outside. So I see this guy struggling. He didn't want to ask anybody for help from the moment he got there till nearly the end. And I thought, man, if you just ask somebody for help, it would help, Right. And so he's on the roof, and he's trying to get to the top of the chimney, but he can't get the ladder up. He can't get the ladder on the wall, and the ladder keeps falling. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, I don't want this man to fall off the roof, and what's going to happen to us? And eventually, I'm at the bottom of the garden, and he's trying to get to the top of the, guard, the, the, the chimney. And I said, man, why don't you just ask for some help? I cried out to him like that. I'm like, why don't you just ask somebody for some help? Because I was so frustrated, and I was so scared he was going to hurt himself. Eventually, he stopped. He's like, oh, that's a good idea. So he called this guy at the bottom and his guy got up the roof and he held the ladder and he fixed everything in a couple of seconds. Because what I realized at that moment as well is when we're feeling hopelessly broken, when we're without hope, it's only God that can help us beat the odds. And I actually sometimes say to myself, Dane, why don't you ask God for help? Why don't we be like, you know, we're sometimes that person that's so stubborn trying to fix the chimney ourselves but it's God that gives us the power to hope, not ourselves. So let's fast forward in this passage. And this tells us and reminds us that it's only God that can help us with our hope. Verse 31, Romans 8 verse 31, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, it says this. What then shall we say in response to everything that's been said in Romans chapter 8? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God, the creator of the world, is for us, who can be against us? I really love this world. Because we live in this world where we can sometimes feel like everything is against us, out of control. But as a believer, never ever feel like or fall into the trap of thinking that God is not for you. Never fall into the trap that God is punishing you intentionally because he wants to hurt you. That is not in God's nature. God is for you completely. God loves you. He wants to see you succeed. He wants to see you grow. And sometimes the lessons he, give us, he gives us, they suck and they're hard and they're damaging, but I promise you they help us to become much better people. And if you read these preceding verses in Romans chapter 8, you can see this. If we think about who Paul was, he was in prison. And some of the prison cells were filled with sewage. He would sit in sewage and he would write these letters to us. Who else could have written such a profound letter? Who else knew that God was for him, even while he sat in sewage? You see, sometimes we go through life unaware of where our hope is. We forget 
that our hope is in God. And then Paul goes on to answer this question for us in verse 35. Sorry, he asks us another question in verse 35. He says this. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He mentions these seven things. And I think about who, who would separate us from the love of God? Who separates us from the love of God? And I asked myself that question over and over again last night as I was preparing. And I said, I think we sometimes separate ourselves from the love of God because we forget about who God is. He goes on to say in verse 36, As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we do lead, our lives are a little bit harder because the enemy prowls around, right? Like a, wanting to, to, to catch us out. The enemy is everywhere trying to stop us in our tracks because we are for God and the enemy is against God and the enemy doesn't want us to succeed. So as a Christian, you're not exempt from trials. If anything, there will be more trials because we are believers. I love how he says we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And then he says in verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We will overcome these trials. We will overcome them. We just need to remain hopeful in these trials that we go through. God uses all of these things for his good because we are more than conquerors through Christ. And then in verse 38 and 39, he answers that question from verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He says this. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, ne neither the present or the future or any powers. He answers with seven things again. Will neither, neither heart, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of, Christ, uh, uh, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he uses ten things as a rebuttal to that question. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing will se separate you from the love of God today. See, as a Christian, we've got this eternal pool of hope. I love Hebrews 6 verse 19, and I'm drawing to a close right now. It says that we have this hope as an anchor for our souls. I love that imagery, that analogy. We have this hope. God is an anchor for our souls. And nothing will separate us from the love of God. We need to place our hope in our unfailing love of God because God never fails to love us. We fail to love one another, but God never fails to love us. The last thought that I want to leave you with as I close this morning is there's three types of hope that we have as human beings. We've got a goal-orientated hope. We've got strategic and planned hope. And we've got motivational driving force hope. Goal-orientated hope is you're going to set goals for yourself. You're going to say, this week I'm going to train every day. I'm going to wake up at 4 o'clock. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to have my devotion time. I'm going to go to work. And I'm going to spend two hours a day with my children. But the reality is life is life. And that doesn't always happen the way we planned it. Excuse me. And so that hope, it's not futile, but it can fail us. We've got the strategic planned hope where you say, this year... My strategy is to budget this amount, and by the sixth month, we will get there, and we'll be able to pay off half of our bond, using a silly analogy, but that's a strategic plan type of hope. And that hope also fails us at some point, because life is life, <laughs> and stuff happens. But then we've got this motivational driving force hope. And this could be Psalm 33, verse 22, which I've asked you to memorize. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You, Lord Jesus, are my driving force today. You, O oh God, never fail to love me. You are my motivation for being who I am and doing what I do today. You see how that changes things? So what is your driving force? What gives you hope? How do you use God to give you hope? So I invite you all this morning to rediscover the hope that God can and is able to give you. And, and, and all it takes for you is to take that, 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 that step. It's sometimes so hard to hope in God and to trust in Him because we can't see Him. 
And it's sometimes so hard to hope and to trust in a letter because we don't know. We're uncertain. It's wobbly. We don't know if it's going to fall. We don't know if we're going to fall. We, we hope for the best when we stand on a ladder. But it takes that trust element and that faith element. And that's the same trust and faith that you need to put your hope in God. And let me just read these last two verses and then I'm going to pray. Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I'm convinced that neither death or life or angels or demons, the present or future or any powers, neither height or depth or anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. And so you can be rest assured by putting your hope in Christ, you're doing the best thing you can possibly do for your life. Let's pray. How do we maintain hope in a world that feels hopelessly broken, O oh Lord? Father God, this is a preamble to, to communion. We understand, Father God, that there may be people here that are feeling hopelessly broken, that feel that they have lost all hope, that feel like there is no point of return. And if that is the case, Father God, may we stand together and united as a church, Lord Jesus, and come around these people and remind one another that our hope is not found in the world, but our hope is found in you. And nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Isn't that wonderful, Lord? And so, Father God, as we prepare our hearts for the communion elements, may we be reminded of this. May I please ask the leadership and the deacons to come forward as we share communion.